<clears throat> okay, so um, I'm next on the schedule, I guess. I think many of you probably use um, uh, ligands or chelate chemistry for molecular imaging because it, it has applications in virtually all of, of molecular imaging. Uh, maybe not so much in optical imaging, but certainly in, in MR and PET. So uh, this lecture is intended to teach you a little bit sort of the fundamentals about, about ligands and, and when one would choose a particular ligand. Uh, and so what I hope that you would learn from this lecture today is how to choose a particular ligand for a, a particular metal ion. Uh, it seems as though, uh, you know, that oftentimes people simply uh, choose what's available, perhaps commercially, and that may or may not work. Uh, why? So it's important to think about what you're doing. Uh, macrocyclic ligands versus acyclic ligands, there are pros and cons to each of them, so we should talk about that a bit. And then, um, which, um, which are more important for metal chelate applications, you know, thermodynamics or kinetics? Most people think about thermodynamics as being the important parameter here. What I'd like to convince you of is that kinetics may in fact be more important for in vivo applications. Okay, now first, uh, some of you, it's probably been years for some of you that have had some basic uh, introduction to uh, coordination chemistry, so just some definitions. Um, the, a ligand is really defined as any anion or organic molecule that donates a pair of electrons to a metal ion. So for example, over here in this, um, let's see, is this, yeah. So this is the familiar cisplatinum that is used uh, in oncology. And you could, uh, this, this platinum here has two different types of ligands attached to it. It has amino groups, two, two simple um, ammonia molecules donating a pair of electrons, and it has two chlorides. Uh, so those are called ligands. Um, in this second example of a cisplatinum, there's uh, one bidentate ligand. So this is like taking these two amino molecules and hooking them together with an organic linker. Uh, so that's a bidentate chelate, and these are monodentate chelates. And then, of course, you have more complicated structures such as uh, nitrolotriacetic acid that has nitrogen and three carboxyl groups. So that's called a tetradentate ligand. And then uh, probably the most familiar ligand of all is uh, ethylene diamine tet tetraacetic acid, EDTA. It's a hexadentate ligand. Now, multidentate ligands such as these that bind to metals, they do so by displacing solvent molecules. And most of us work in water, so it's often water molecules to form some sort of a metal ligand complex. And these multidentate ligands then are called chelating agents, so this would be called a chelating agent. And that's derived from a Greek word meaning claw. And the resulting metal ligand complexes are called chelates. So oftentimes you hear these terms perhaps uh, used improperly. So the difference between a ligand and a metal ligand complex and a chelate. So typical chelates that you might uh, be familiar with are things like gadolinium DTPA, would be called a metal ligand complex or a chelate, gallium NTA, or perhaps iron EDTA. Now there are lots of ligands that are available, macrocyclic ligands of all type. I've just picked out a few familiar ones here. Probably the most widely known macrocyclic ligand is called DOTA. Uh, Tata is very much like Dota, except it has a bigger ring structure, as you see here. So this is a 12-membered ring. This is a 14-membered ring. Uh, Noda has three nitrogens in the ring, and it's a nine-membered ring. Right? And then you have a little bit more complicated structures, like this cross-bridge uh, Tata structure here, and then a molecule called PCTA, in which one of the ring nitrogens is really a pyridine nitrogen. Um, then we have... Um, a large variety of acyclic ligands, most of which are derived from DTPA. So uh, this diethylene uh, triamine pentacetic acid has a linear triamine with five uh, carboxyl groups or five acetates attached. So this is a very versatile ligand. It binds to all sorts of metals, uh, not necessarily very well, but in, in some cases really quite well. <laughs> And then you can have uh, derivatives of DTPA, such as this one with a cyclohexylamine in the backbone that makes it a little bit more rigid. And then there are a much more complicated structures like this desferioxamine that really doesn't even look like a ligand at all, but in fact it works quite well for certain metals. Okay, now <clears throat> most of the time you're interested in attaching these ligands to something. So um, either maybe a peptide or an antibody or something like this. So over the, the, number, you know, the last 10 years or so, so 
There have been lots of bifunctional ligands that have been prepared. Many of these are available commercially now. Um, here's an example of DOTA where the linkage is really through one of the side chain uh, carboxyl groups. That, that's called a, a DO3A monoamide. Um, here's one that's, that retains the four carboxyl groups of DOTA, so it's a little bit more complicated structure, but again, coordinated through the side chain. And then we have all these backbone derivatives that are, that are prepared from, uh, usually from an isothiocyanate derivative of a benzyl derivative such as this. So there are backbone structures of DOTA and NODA and PCTA and even now the Crossbridge PCTA. So there are lots of examples of different types of bifunctional chelates. So with all these available, you know, how does one choose which one's the best one? Um, if you have them all available to you, and many of them are available commercially. So how do you choose the right ligand? And the answer is, well, it depends, of course. That's always the answer, right? And it depends upon things such as the size matching of the metal ion and the ligand cavity. In other words, I'll show you that that's an important consideration. Depends upon thermodynamics. How stable does the chelate really need to be for your particular application? How long is it going to remain in the animal or in the person? Um, it depends upon kinetics of metal ligand formation. That is, usually you want to be able to, to form a complex quickly. And it may depend upon the charge of the resulting chelate. You know, maybe it needs to be charged or perhaps neutral. So there's a lot of options uh, and a lot of answers. So if you look at the literature in, in MR and PET and SPECT, for example, I think everybody here recognizes that gadolinium agents have been around now since the late 80s, um, and many of them are based upon derivatives of either DOTA or DTPA, so these are common uh, ligands. These are eight coordinate ligands, and you need eight coordinate for gadolinium because it has a large coordination sphere. So you have one water molecule that's usually exchanging quite rapidly. Uh, in PET, you have a variety of different PET uh, radioisotopes, copper 64, gallium, yttrium, and of course the particular ligand that you would choose for each of these is, is going to depend upon the, the metal uh, radionuclide. Uh, so we'll go over a little bit as to why you would choose these. Um, some of the ligand characteristics, uh, you know, for example, gallium, I'll show you in a minute, prefers uh, hard types of donor atoms, whereas uh, larger ions might prefer soft. Um, <clears throat> so factors to consider in the design of, of ligands for various metals, selection of ligand donor atoms, and this is usually based upon an old principle called hard and soft acids and bases that's been around uh, the inorganic chemistry literature for probably 40 years. Um, and I'll go through that briefly. Uh, the role of the ligand architecture, whether you choose cyclic or acyclic, really depends upon the size match that you're looking for. And of course, as I mentioned before, the kinetics are important. The ligands with flexible backbones tend to form structures rather quickly, but they also tend to dissociate more quickly in vivo. So uh, we have to consider both those options. Macrocyclic ligands form complexes more slowly in general, although I'll show you there are exceptions to that, but they also dissociate more slowly, so you may be concerned about dissociation. Now, hardened soft acids and base, bases goes back to a very simple principle, and that is you have different donor atoms, phosphorus, sulfur, nitrogen, and a phosphorus atom is larger, it's more polarizable, it's considered a soft kind of ligand. Whereas if you get down here to oxygen or fluorine, they're much more compact, they're smaller, and are considered hard. And so what you like to do in, in matching that up with a metal ion is that if you have a metal ion that prefers hard ligands, ligand donors, then of course you choose oxygen or nit nitrogen-based systems. So for example, in the third, third row transition model ions, as you go across the series like this from scandium to, to zinc, uh, you'll see that it's hard to make these comparisons, but if you choose divalent ions, you can look up their ionic radii, and you can see as you go from titanium to iron, the ionic radii gets quite a bit smaller. There's a contraction because of the increase in nuclear charge. And so iron would prefer, you know, this would be considered a harder ion than this would be considered softer. And so again, the, the type of ligands that you would choose depending upon, would depend upon which of these metals that you, that you uh, are using. And of course, charge on the metal is important. If you have a, a, a positively charged, monopositive charged uh, ion, it's considered much softer, and a trivalent uh, metal ion is considered quite hard. So vanadium-2 has a very large ionic radius. By the time you get to vanadium-4, it's really quite small. 
vanadium-4 complexes are virtually all uh, oxygen types of systems. And then as one progresses down the series, you could say the same thing. So if you go from 3D to 4D to 5D, and the best example is probably here with zinc, cadmium, and mercury. Mercury is considered a, a soft metal ion. And so mercury, when it's in vivo, usually is attached to things like sulfur of, of cysteines and that sort of thing. Whereas zinc is, a, is a, considered a hard metal ion and it's going to be bound to more oxygen types of ligand donors. So uh, very simple principles and yet they're, they're, they really work quite well. Okay, now what about size? Well, <clears throat> a good example of size is here's gadolinium down here in the middle of the lanthanide series. It's a 4F7 electron configuration. It has an ionic radius uh, close to one angstrom. And if you compare gadolinium binding to DOTA and NOTA, you can see that the binding constant with DOTA is quite large. These are log K values, so 10 to the 24th, whereas with NOTA, it's only 10 to the 14th. So there's a 10 orders of magnitude difference in stability between these two structures. And that's largely because the gadolinium fits very well into the DOTA structure, and it's really, quite, it's really too large for the NOTA structure. Gallium, on the other hand, which is up here in the periodic table, Right? It is a 3D10 configuration. It's a much smaller ion. And here, if you look at thermodynamics, the literature is a little bit confounding because gallium thermodynamics is rather difficult. Uh, the stability constants are somewhere in the low 20s here. And when you get to the smaller ligand, it's much more stable. So clearly, the size of the ligand and the, and the metal ion does make a difference. Now, a little bit about thermodynamics. So if one writes a, an equation, say writing with a, starting with a lanthanide ion and some protonated ligand, right, you can form a, a, a lanthanide ligand complex right, and release a proton. This is typically what happens when you mix a ligand with a metal ion in solution. And uh, <clears throat> depending upon pH, you can measure what are called conditional stability constants. And that would be uh, a conditional constant would be whatever this equilibrium constant is at a particular pH, for example. So it's, a, it's conditional dependent. A thermodynamic constant, however, is, is really this equilibrium here. And that is um, the, the binding constant that would, be pro that would be apparent if there were no protons competing for the metal line. So clearly, a conditional constant depends upon uh, things like pKa's. So if there's one proton involved here, then the highest pKa of the ligand, the most basic site, would be, would be part of the equation. So typically what you do to determine a thermodynamic uh, stability constant is use a an old technique that's been around for, you know, hundred, well, I shouldn't say hundreds of years, but at least since the, the discovery of the pH electrode. It's a pretty simple experiment that as you measure pH as a function of at doing a titration, you probably did this in freshman chemistry at some point, Right? And from an analysis of this, then here's the ligand by itself, and this is after you add, say, one equivalent of copper or something. You can see that the copper displaces all these protons over here, and by analysis of these two curves using some complicated mathematics, you can get stability constants that look like this, 10 to the 23rd. Or in some cases, you have uh, metals that form complexes very slowly. You have to actually do this in what is called an out-of-cell technique, where you make up samples and let them sit around for a month or so and wait for them to come to equilibrium. And then you can determine things like um, proportional di diagrams like this, showing the, the different species that are present as a function of pH. Okay, so we got involved in this uh, a long time ago in looking at stability constants of ligands. This shows you a a diagram from an old paper. I like this diagram uh, simply because it shows you here's NOTA and EDTA. And even though, so this is a hexadentate ligand, this is a hexadentate ligand, right? This one is a, is a macrocycle. This one is a little bit more flexible. It can wrap around the metal a little bit easier. And you can see that EDTA forms much more stable complexes with the trivalent lanthanides than does NOTA. And that's again because they're, these ions are all too, these ions up here are all too large for NOTA. Uh, here's a comparison of two octadentate ligands, DTPA, which is very flexible, and the macrocyclic ligand DOTA. And you can see DOTA here, you get an increased instability right at the middle of the series. And that's because the gadolinium fits rather well into this, whereas the, the earlier lanthanides are a little bit too large. So one can learn a lot by just measuring thermodynamic stability constants with ligands and your particular metal of interest. Okay, so the, um, the, the ligand also plays a role. So here's an example of 
uh, stability constants with, uh, here's DOTA with gadolinium, 24.7. If you make a monoamide of, of DOTA and reduce the charge a bit, you can see it drops off by four orders of magnitude, which is really quite a lot. If you put charge back into the system with something like uh, this side chain where you have excess charge now, the stability gets even, even larger. And then if you go to a really negatively charged system such as DOTP, uh, the stability is larger still. So clearly the charge on the ligand plays a role in determining the stability of the resulting complexes. Now, one can, one can play with these equations uh, many different ways. To write an equilibrium expression as this, and we know it's related, obviously, an equilibrium is related to the forward and reverse rate constants. And so uh, we, can, we can rearrange these equations and show that, for example, here, what we should find is a relationship between the stability constants of a particular metal ligand complex and the pKa of the ligand. Okay, so this is the, the pKa of this process up here. And in fact, if you go back to, again, some of the early literature, you see nice relationships like this, log stability constant versus the sum of the pKa's of the ligand. So this just shows you some, uh, some uh, typical uh, tetracarboxylate systems. Um, I think there are eight ligands here, a very nice relationship between the stability and the pKa. So in principle, if you take a ligand and do a, a titration, determine the pKa's of the ligand, you can get a pretty good idea of what the stability is if you know uh, this uh, particular relationship. Now, <clears throat> this is done, this is a, a more recent uh, version. I'm not even sure this book's been published yet. I know that it's, uh, I happen to have seen this because I was involved in, with one of the chapters. But nevertheless, there's a more recent compilation. You can see there's like something like 30 ligands here showing you the relationship between, between stability and the pKa of the ligand. Now let's talk a little bit about kinetics, which is something that's really um, quite different than thermodynamics, obviously. Um, I showed you before that when you made a complex with yttrium, that it formed complexes very slowly, that is with DOTA. And the question is, why does that happen? Why are some ligands so slow to form complexes, whereas others are not? Well, with DOTA, the ligand itself is rather pre-organized. So this is a sort of a hypothetical structure, but nevertheless, the carboxyl groups are, are positioned above the ring. And then you form, a, and when you add a trivalent metal ion, such as yttrium or gadolinium or something like this, what happens immediately is that it sees this negatively charged surface, so it very quickly forms some sort of a, a, a complex like this, where there's still several water molecules attached to the metal. And then it's a question of how quickly does it drop down into the ring. So here's the ultimate complex where the, now the lanthanide is down into the ring itself and now there's only uh, one water remaining. But this is the slow step. So this, in order for this to occur, one of the protons that's down here on the, on the macrocyclic nitrogen has to come off first. So it's, it's determined by how rapidly that proton can come off that nitrogen and allow the, the lanthanide then to slide down into the, into the macrocyclic cavity. So clearly it's related to how, how basic this nitrogen is. The kinetics are related to the basicity of the system. And this is shown here. Here's a, a log of the forward rate constant for a series of ligands. This was published by Krishnan Kumar and Mike Tweedle a number of years ago, showing that if you have ligands with less basic nitrogen, so over here, that the metal complex formation is much quicker, right? So the forward rate constant is much faster. These are 10 to the eighth, okay? So clearly the ligand plays a, plays a role. Now people have been working on, on for, for uh, nuclear medicine applications, working on new types of ligands for many of the radionuclides. Uh, copper has been a particular interest to many people because copper 64 is becoming very popular. And, of course, many people just go ahead and use DOTA because it's available. On the other hand, copper DOTA isn't all that stable in vivo. I mean, DOTA is an octadentate ligand. It has too many ligands that, that uh, copper can't use them all. And so, in fact, you're better off using copper NOTA if you can. It's more stable. But some of these other, and then there's this cross-bridge TATA that many people believe is the best system. The problem with these is that they also form complexes quite slowly. So if you take these ligands and attach them to an antibody or something, then uh, you have a problem forming complexes perhaps in the time required for your experiment. And so people have been looking at other types of ligands. So here's two examples I wanted to point out. This is, this is a classical DOTA structure. 
and here's a PCTA and an OXO system. So they simply have removed one of the nitrogens of the DOTA structure here and reduced the number of donor, donor atoms. You've also reduced the pKa of the nitrogens in these rings, and all of that helps in forming a, a complex. And this shows you then, here's, uh, here's different ratios of ligand to copper 64, but you can see that DOTA forms a complex you know, over a period of about 20 or 30 minutes. Whereas the OXO and the PCA t uh, P PCTA type ligands, these two over here form complexes much more quickly. And so this is important for antibody labeling. And so I think there's new types of bifunctional chelates such as these that may turn out to be important for, uh, for copper. This also shows you that what happens is you, if you make these complexes and look at their stability as a function of pH, you can see that the DOTA system falls apart down to pH 2, whereas the other ones remain intact. So there are some, some big advantages. For, for imaging, uh, for PET imaging, it's uh, actually all, all three of the complexes work. And so uh, in this particular example, but there are examples in the literature where copper is actually released and ends up going to the liver. So it's important to consider which ligand uh, for the particular application. Um, DTPA has been around a long time, and I think people use it simply because it's available. So this is some old data from Martin Breckbill showing that if you take gadolinium DTPA, which is a, a contrast agent, and simply put it into uh, serum, you can see that over a period of days, this is, yeah, this is several days, the gadolinium DTPA tends to dissociate. Whereas if you make uh, ligands that are very similar to DTPA in structure, except the backbone has been rigidified by putting these ring structures into it, uh, then you can make systems that thermodynamically are very similar to that of DTPA, and yet stability-wise, kinetically, they are, are less prone to, be, to release the metal. So clearly, the, the ligand is important in all this. And I, <clears throat> I think this is my final shot slide I wanted to show you. This is... Uh, these are two, actually three, gadolinium contrast agents that are widely used. These are all clinically uh, uh, approved agents. Uh, DTPA, DOTA, here's the bis amide of DTPA. And this is a tetra amide of DTPA that we've been working on a lot lately uh, for a, another application called CEST. But nevertheless, it's interesting because if you look at the thermodynamic stability of these four ligands, DOTA is by far the, lar the most stable complex um, in solution. DTPA is a little bit weaker, but still quite stable. The bis amide of DTPA falls off quite a bit, and by the time you get to this tetra amide, it drops off dramatically. So the log K here is about 12. The log K of, of, of DOTA, the parent ligand, is about 26. So, I mean, there's a huge difference in thermodynamic stability. Yet, if you look at the kinetic stabilities, it's really quite different. So here are the kinetic stabilities as measured in, by taking these complexes and throwing them into strong acid. And what you find is that DOTA will dissociate in strong acid with a half-life, these are half-lives here, of 50 hours. So DOTA is really quite stable, gadolinium DOTA in solution. DTPA and the bis amide of DTPA dissociate very quickly in strong acid. But here's the tetra amide. You can see here the, the kinetic stability is actually you know, almost an order of magnitude, not quite. 250 hours in strong acid. So these systems thermodynamically are very unstable, but kinetically they're very inert, and so consequently they're, they're really quite useful or quite safe for in vivo applications. So I believe in the future we're going to see more and more designs of ligands like this for other types of applications. Okay, so the take-home lessons, I think uh, hopefully I've shown you why it's important to choose a proper ligand for a particular metal ion for molecular imaging. The, uh, the ligand size and donor type should match the characteristics of the metal, so it's important that you consider these things. Macrocyclic ligands versus acyclic, well, you, there are applications for both of them, but I think you need to consider which are the important ones. Um, the macrocyclic ligands form stable complexes, but they also tend to form more slowly, so if, you have, if you're in a hurry, if you have a short-lived uh, radionuclide, then you have to worry about that. And the question then is, what's more important for metal chelate applications in vivo? Most people talk about thermodynamics, but I, I really think that that isn't all that important. The kinetics are probably the more important, uh, the more, more important consideration. So if you're really serious about this in terms of translational work, you should worry about kinetics because I think it's really quite important. Okay, I think that's my last slide. Thank you very much.